Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. I have a few announcements to share with you. The Tuesday fireside chat with Pastor Tim and me discussing the life of the church will continue this week. If you would have a question or a topic that you would like us to discuss, please send that to Pastor Tim or to me at our email address on the church website. That conversation will be available on Tuesday afternoon. Pastor Ron introduced his fireside chat series on the Beatitudes two days ago, and we'll look at the first Beatitude on Friday this week. That recording will be available on the website and church app on Friday morning. The prayer meeting will continue this week on Wednesday, as well as the TFC virtual meeting. Ladies Bible Study is putting together a way to continue studying together during this season of being separated. Please contact the church office if you have any questions or if you would want some more information. For the most up-to-date information about Ministries of Grace BFC, please check your emails and the church website. Now, let's remove any distractions so we can worship the risen Christ. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. The fact that our Savior is alive and resurrected from the dead is just as true last week, uh, this week as it was last week, and it'll be just as true next week. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are delighted to worship a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You alone are worthy of our worship. As we worship you, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we worship you in full and grateful hearts. May you engage our minds as well as our hearts as well. This, this morning as we worship you, may we delight in hearing from you through your word, and may everything that we say and do be a sweet savor, a fragrant aroma to you, our great God. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, and I invite you to take your Bibles if you're able, and turn with me to John's Gospel. In a sense, we are going to pick up this week in Pastor Tim's sermon, right where we left off last week. You remember that last week we left with, with Mary Magdalene and Peter and John at the empty tomb. Our reading this morning will be John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, 
but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Thus ends the reading of God's living and life-giving word. Shall we pray together? Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the gift of faith. We ourselves have not seen Jesus yet with our own eyes, but we have believed. That is not because we are smarter or more gifted or have greater perception than anyone else, but because you have opened our eyes to see the beauty and the glory of the gospel of the risen Savior, your Son, the Lord Jesus. We, we are so grateful that you have done this, that you have enabled us to see things that to the world are mere foolishness, and we believe and we trust, and we ask, Lord, that you would increase our faith we know that these are hard days, but we also know, Lord, that it is in hard days that faith is strengthened as it is stretched. So often we, we have experienced in our own lives that the times we grew most in our trust of, of you and your son are those times when things were dark, when things were hard when pain and suffering was part of our lot. It was then that we could no longer rely upon our own strength, but we had to trust you, and you caused growth in us. You caused us to grow in our character. You taught us precious lessons from your word. Lord, may more of that happen this morning. May you be with your servant, Pastor Tim. Empower him. May every word that comes from his lips be your word accompanied by your spirit. We know that your word carries power, and so we ask that you would help us to take it seriously, to listen and receive, knowing that every word that comes out from you always achieves the purposes for which you send it. Send it with power through your servant, we pray. Lord, we thank you for the great privilege of coming before your throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace in times of trouble. Lord, there's so many things going on and we have so many of our church family who are in need this morning. So we lift up Carol Lindberger and Joetta Moyer. They both have physical trials, but Lord, we know that a peace that passes understanding is available to them from you. May they trust in you and may you support them and comfort them and uphold them, give them exactly what they and their families need. Your word also says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We have several in our church family, as you well know, who are missing loved ones. In many cases, these are loved ones who are now seeing your son, the Lord Jesus, face to face, face to face and hearing those wonderful, precious words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But in each case, there is a separation, um, even though it might be temporary. There is a separation and a longing and a pain that those who mourn have. But we know that the promise that you have made is true, that they will be comforted. They are comforted now with the knowledge that their loved ones are in your presence. They will be comforted in an even greater way when they are re reunited. And I just love, love that fact that you keep every promise. You have gone, your son has gone to prepare a place for each and every one of us and the work done at the cross completed that preparation. And, and now you have called our sister Nancy Zintak home. And we just pray, Lord, that you would comfort Brent you have called Nita Williams to your side, and we pray that you would be ministering to her family. We think of others who have, who have had to say goodbye temporarily, and we pray that while they mourn, may they not mourn as those who have no hope. So now, Lord, we dedicate the rest of this service to you. May you be pleased with the words that are preached, the words that are sung. We ask all this. May you receive glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Tib. I'm the assistant pastor here. Pastor Ron uh, is in Louisville, Kentucky, or at least he was virtually this week. And so that's why you get me this morning instead of Pastor Ron for the sermon. Our focus this morning is going to be on the second half of the scripture reading that Pastor Ron read for us. But before we get going, I'd ask that you join me for a brief word of prayer. God in heaven, we do ask that you would come and that you would speak to us through your word and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. And we pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29 is our text today. This is the story of Jesus and Thomas. And and as we start, I have a question for you. Have you ever heard something that was so unbelievable that you had to see it for yourself in order to believe it? There are many different things that it could have been. There were a couple that I thought of this week. One was when I heard that the Twin Towers had been struck by a terrorist attack. I had to see it to believe it. Maybe for you it was that the government would decide to shut down businesses and schools because of a virus. The example, though, that that first popped into my mind when I thought about this question. What was it that was so unbelievable that I had to see to believe? It was when I heard that my dog, Tad, was on the neighbor's roof. Don't exactly know how he got on the roof. I mean, how, how can that possibly happen? I had to see that that was true. Whatever the unbelievable news is that you've received, though, there was always an answer. In, in Tad's case, it was that he was a dog with lots and lots of enthusiasm. And so once he had pushed his way out through the screen door, he went for a bit of a run. He ran up the hill behind our neighbor's house and and. Once he saw that the neighbor's house had been built into the hill a little bit, it only took one running leap to jump onto the roof. He clambered over to the other side and realized that he was 20 feet off the ground. He had no idea what to do because while Tad may have had a lot of enthusiasm, he was not the cleverest dog. And so he stayed 20 feet off the ground waiting for someone to come rescue him. And so my neighbor came and said, did you know that your dog is on my roof? No matter how strange the answer is, there's always an answer to why something that seems unbelievable can still be true. That brings us to Thomas. It brings us to the passage that we have read in John 20. Was he being asked to believe something that was unbelievable? That, That really is the question that we need to ask ourselves as we approach this text. Was it unbelievable? In order to answer that question, I think we first need to start by understanding who Thomas is. Who is Thomas? Thomas is one of the disciples. He is the king of the unflattering nickname, though. He has come to be known simply as Doubting Thomas. Like many other pastors and commentators that I read this week, I I think that, that that's a bit unfair for Thomas. This is not the only thing that we know about Thomas, but it it is in keeping with his character. We we always ask the question in in, in our world, do you see the glass as half empty or as half full? From what we know about Thomas, he, he may not have noticed that there was anything in the glass at all. John records two other instances where Thomas spoke to Jesus. They're helpful in giving us some insight into who Thomas was. In chapter 14, Jesus is is telling the disciples that he is going away. And and so I'll pick up the reading with Jesus' words in verse 4. He said, And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? As Jesus is talking to his disciples in the upper room on the night before he was killed, he tells them that they know the way to where he is going. Thomas seems to step up immediately and say, actually, no, I don't. The other example of Thomas talking to Jesus or talking with Jesus is in John chapter 11. There, as as Jesus hears the news about Lazarus, his friend, and he knows that he is going to die, he tells the disciples that it's time to go to Bethany to see Lazarus' family. The disciples, they, they remind Jesus at the time that the Jewish leaders in that area are looking to kill Jesus. 
And then this exchange takes place in verses 14 through 16. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas doesn't exactly seem like a barrel of laughs. One pastor that I read this week compared him to Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. It's always just a little bit gloomy. But we need to be careful when we read about Thomas. See, it may seem like Thomas tends to look at the glass as half empty. But we also need to think about the statements that he made. What is Thomas saying in these verses? His desire is to be with Jesus. He doesn't understand everything that Jesus has taught him about the way to be with him in heaven, but he desperately wants to be with Christ. And he could have found a more optimistic way to say this, maybe, but, but he's the one who tells the rest of the disciples that, that even if they should have to die for Jesus, then that's their duty and they should go and do it. He does not want to abandon Jesus, and, and so he listens to Jesus, and, and it, seems to be G, it seems to be Thomas's words that convince the rest of the disciples that they should go with Jesus to Bethany. Thomas was a bit of a pessimist, but he was genuine, and he loved and trusted Christ as much as any other disciple. That's why I say that he gets, I think, the worst nickname. Sure, Thomas was, was not a glass half full kind of guy like John seems to be. But for all that he is remembered for to be that he was doubtful, that seems to be unfair. When we ask the question, who is Thomas? The, the answer might just be, well, Thomas is a whole lot like me. He trusted and, and followed Christ. He, he wanted to trust he wanted to be with Christ. He, he just didn't always get it right away. And so when asked to believe something unbelievable, he simply wanted some proof. He couldn't believe it until he saw it for himself. And he's not even alone in that. The Apostle John said back in verse 9 of, of our chapter, chapter 20, that as yet none of the disciples understood the scripture that Jesus must rise again. They all doubted at first. So why is Thomas singled out? He was a faithful follower of Christ who loved him and trusted him. So what was it about Thomas that made him different? What was Thomas's problem? At this point of the story, we need to be careful. I've spent the last several minutes ex explaining to you how unfair it is for Thomas to get the nickname of Doubting Thomas. And this is something that, that I saw pointed out by commentators and pastors that I read, but we've spent a lot of time trying to, trying to lay out why we should be kinder to Thomas. Going back to the introduction, I, I had asked the question, you know, we, we thought about what, what does it take when you're asked to believe something that is unbelievable, what do you have to have? You have to have some proof. And here is Thomas asked to believe something that, that really does sound unbelievable. The other disciples say to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And it's unfair to suggest that Thomas should have believed them, right? I say we need to be careful because in our attempt to exonerate Thomas, we may go too far. Farther than, than John goes. Farther even than Jesus goes. There is a problem with Thomas. D.A. Carson said, although it is possible to paint him in romantic shades, picturing him as a common sense disciple, all too aware of how imagination can play tricks, it is hard not to perceive in his attitude at least a little of what Jesus had earlier condemned in John 4, 48. Well, what did Jesus say in John 4, 48? Jesus said, unless you see signs, you will never believe. That was a condemnation from Jesus. So here is the problem. 
unless he sees a sign, Thomas will not believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. We can all make excuses for Thomas, and we can make as many as we want. Most of them may seem justified. The other disciples didn't believe at first either. They got to see Jesus. In verse 20, Jesus shows the other disciples exactly the same things that Thomas is asking to see. Also, how can we blame Thomas for not believing that a dead man had come back to life? That, that's an unbelievable thing. But is it? Is it unbelievable that Jesus had risen from the dead? Think back to John chapter 11 when, when Thomas declared that the disciples should go to die with Jesus. What happened later on in John chapter 11? Why was it that Jesus needed to put his life in danger by going to Bethany in the first place? Jesus went to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. And what's more, immediately before Thomas' statement, Jesus had said, Lazarus has died, and for your sakes I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Jesus waited for Lazarus to die so that he could raise him from the dead. And the point was to prove to everyone, and especially to the disciples, that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It was to show them that he had the authority to lay down his life and to take it up again. For John, as, as he's writing this, this is enough foreshadowing for the reader to understand that the disciples should have understood Jesus' message. But they didn't get it. The other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record that Jesus told the disciples on three separate occasions that he was going to be killed and that he would rise from the dead. Thomas's problem is that he doubted something that was believable. That he was expected to believe because Jesus had told him and shown him about the resurrection. And just, just look at the way that Thomas responded. In verse 25 of our passage, he says, unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. This response is not simple doubt. It is adamant unbelief. He didn't say, oh, I really wish that I, I could believe this, but you know, I just, it's just a really hard thing for me to believe. No, he he says if, if there's no physical proof, he will never believe. I said this was Thomas's problem, but that may only be part of the truth. Much like we, we may see some of ourselves in Thomas's personality, I think we may see ourselves in some of his doubts. I don't know all of you who are watching this. I've talked to enough people and I've had enough thoughts run through my own mind that I know that many of us have had thoughts like Thomas. Some of you have, have wanted to cut Thomas a break much more than I seem to be willing to. Can we really expect Thomas to believe that, that Jesus had risen from the dead without seeing him? Isn't that unbelievable? Well, my answer is, is that it cannot be unbelievable that Thomas could have believed without seeing. This is the very point that Jesus makes at the end of the story. It's not that Thomas's faith doesn't count because he saw Jesus, but, but that it is possible and even a blessing to believe in the risen Christ without seeing him. And this is the very thing that we are called to do today. The end of, of the Gospels, they, they tell us that Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection. He's no longer walking on the earth for us to see with our eyes. We can't reach out and touch him with our hands, and yet we are called to believe. How are we expected to believe such an unbelievable thing? Are we really to place our trust in miracles, in, in the supernatural? Yes. 
Yes, we are. And that may scare some of you. We, we want evidence. We want proof. We want hard facts. Well, there is evidence. There are eyewitnesses. They recorded the events. And, and there are prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. And this is another prophecy that he fulfills. It's in keeping with his character. It's in keeping with what else we read about him. And as Pastor Ron mentioned last week, there are, there's more written evidence that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than of the speeches that Julius Caesar gave. But no matter what the evidence is that I lay out there in front of you, there is something that I'm asking you to do that is uncomfortable. I'm asking you to admit that you are not in control. That you do not have all the answers. And that there is something, that there is someone out there who is greater than you. Thomas struggled to believe even after hearing the promises of Jesus. Even after being an eyewitness to Jesus' miracles. He's not alone in this. Many people in the early church found it hard to believe as well. Someone raised from the dead is just not a normal occurrence. The Apostle Paul had to confront this in, in the book 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. In that chapter, he, he gives the evidence for the resurrection, but he goes on to make the point that the whole Christian religion hangs on this one point. That Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. Without that miracle, there is no reason for Christianity. This is the problem with Thomas. And this may be the problem that you have as well. To deny Jesus as risen from the dead, it makes the rest of Christianity worthless. Thomas could not believe without yet more evidence. For Thomas... Only seeing was believing. What about you? Will, will you believe the evidence of the eyewitness John? Will you believe in this miracle? Well, thankfully for Thomas and thankfully for us, this is not the end of the story. The glass is overflowing. As we look back at our text, as we come, we realize we've, we've only read the first two verses. We've only talked about who Thomas is and, and what his problem was. As we look at the rest of it, we see in verse 26 that, that Jesus comes, and, and he comes in the counting of the Jewish calendar the next Sunday evening. He comes, and, and what is the way that he comes? Well, he comes, and he, he says to Thomas in verse 27, Put your finger here and see my hands and, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. What a statement. The way that Christ comes to Thomas is so wonderful. He comes knowing what Thomas had said, proving that he, he is omniscient, that he knows all things. He shows this by, by telling Thomas to do exactly what Thomas said he needed to do in order to believe. I've just spent the last few minutes laying out why Thomas should have believed. All the things that Jesus had said and done that Thomas hadn't picked up on. And yet here comes Jesus. And how does he come to Thomas? He comes with gentleness, with grace and, and compassion for him. This interaction, it, it teaches us a wonderful truth about Jesus. Is that he is kind and, and compassionate. And that he calls us to believe in him by meeting us where we are. Now, we cannot presume on his kindness. It will not last forever and it may not be the way that Jesus always works. He can also come and, and knock you off your horse and shout at you and leave you blinded like he did to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 8. I'm not saying that he won't do that. 
Only that the way he comes to Thomas is in keeping with the way that Jesus normally approaches those who do not believe. Like the countless crowds on whom he had compassion during his time on earth. Come, touch and see, just like you said you needed to. I think one of the most fascinating aspects of this interaction between Jesus and Thomas is, is Thomas's response. Thomas says that, that unless he sees and touches Jesus, he will never believe. But then, at least the way that John writes it, and I, I think this is intentional, Thomas doesn't touch. It, it's been argued and that maybe Thomas did touch and John just didn't record it, but that may be. I mean, Jesus did command him to touch him. And so it's, it's entirely possible that Thomas did that. But regardless of whether Thomas actually reached out and touched Jesus in his wounds, John records it this way on purpose. The point that John is making in the way that he records it, the point that Thomas makes, is that he no longer needed to reach out and touch Jesus. For the first recorded time in Thomas' life, the cup wasn't half empty. It wasn't even half full. It was overflowing. There's no downside here. There's no gloom, no disbelief. There's no resignation that this could still turn out badly. There is only Christ. And Thomas is overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed with thankfulness, with belief, and with love and commitment to Christ. Christ. All he can say is what has been called the most important statement in the whole Gospel of John. My Lord and my God. I need to talk about that statement for a minute. We need to understand that statement. It's a remarkable confession. Who is Jesus Christ? There are a lot of answers that, that we could give. A lot of right answers. Peter is, is given great credit by Jesus for saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Peter's confession that, that Jesus was the Messiah that the people had been waiting for, it's, it's a wonderful statement, but it's said that Thomas's confession is even better. My Lord and my God. Jesus is Lord. This title that Thomas gives him here, it's, it's one of sovereignty, someone who rules over all things. There are also many connections that are made by using this word, by using this term, connections to the Old Testament about the Lord being the Savior of his people. All of these things, all that is wrapped up with, with who the Lord is, that the Lord is one who rules and who saves, that is all wrapped up and packed into this statement that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is also God. He is divine. The God of Israel. This would be blasphemy and punishable by death if it were not true. This is the highest title, the, the highest praise that any person can give. Thomas declares that Jesus is the God of the universe, the highest being and worthy of worship. But there's one more thing. There's one more thing that the, the pastor and theologian James Boyce pointed out about Thomas' statement. He said, it was not enough that Jesus be both God and sovereign. He was now to be that for Thomas personally, my Lord and my God. Jesus does not correct Thomas here. He doesn't correct him because Thomas was correct. God is personal. He draws near and reveals himself to his people so that he can not only be Lord and God, but our Lord and our God. We, we know that this is available to us because of Jesus' words here at the end. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
we have the same faith, the same trust in Christ that Thomas did. And, and so our relationship to Jesus is the same as his. He is our Lord. He is our God. But that begs a question. What does it mean to call Jesus my Lord? It means giving your whole life to be at his service. Admitting, as, as I said earlier, that, that you are not in control. And that there is something and someone greater who demands that we give him every aspect of our lives. Thomas held on to the control over his own thoughts and actions at first. But upon seeing Jesus, upon seeing the wounds that he bore in his own body for Thomas's sins, there was no response left other than to give all to Christ and to declare, you are my Lord. Friends, the, the wounds that Jesus received, the death that he died, it was for your sins and for mine. When we see him risen from the dead, not as Thomas did with his own physical eyes, but, but in our hearts as we, as we trust the words of the Bible, how can our response be any less than Thomas's? We must cry out to him, my Lord and my God. I turn all of my life, my hopes and, and dreams, my actions, my passions, I, I turn it all over to you, Lord. I will only do as you ask, because you deserve and demand nothing less. Jesus is worthy because he is my Lord and my God, because he is my salvation. So have you, will you cry out with Thomas, my Lord and my God, and give him everything that you are? I've come to love this passage of scripture. Thomas was asked to believe something that he thought was unbelievable. He disbelieved because he thought that he lacked evidence. But upon seeing Jesus, he, he saw what Jesus had done for him. And he throws away all the doubts and he believes. Now, the Bible is very clear that Jesus is Lord and that he is God. It's also clear that, that he died in our place and that his sacrifice on our behalf was accepted by God the Father because he raised him back to life. So if seeing is believing, if seeing is believing the way Thomas thought it was, then we would be without hope. But Jesus' own words point to a blessing, a blessing of salvation and hope to those who have believed without seeing with physical eyes. We see Christ in the pages of Scripture. And when we do, when we see who he is, and when we see what he has done, will we say to him, you are my Lord and my God. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I am so thankful for your word. And I'm so thankful for your disciple Thomas, who shows us what it looks like to live in the world in which we live, to want more and more evidence, to not trust anything that we don't see with our own eyes. Yet you have revealed yourself in your word. Would you help us, Lord, to trust you, to trust in you for our salvation, but also to give everything to you, that our lives would be living sacrifices, that you would rule over every corner of our lives. We pray this in his name. Amen. And now hear the benediction. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. So now, may our Lord and God multiply mercy, peace, 
and love to you. Amen.